Sorry for turning into Henry Miller on you in that last uh, post, but uh, I get uh, so emotional when I think about my condition and uh, it just, I get aggravated, but I shouldn't take it, I should be careful about, more careful about how I present myself, I guess. Uh, I didn't really get a chance to shave this morning because Unfortunately, I've shared. We have shared facilities here, and somebody got to it before I did. Uh, uh, yes, and we have shared facilities here, and I don't hide it. I'm unashamed of this. Uh, my reasons for being here are quite innocent, and I'm unashamed, and I don't hide anything. I have nothing to hide. But if people do have something to hide from you on TV, and it's me. It's me. And it's my 4,000 blogs that all had to come off of their networks. And it's my 200 songs that had to come off the radio. I don't know if all of them, but a lot of them had to come off the radio. I know there was a whole, there was a whole chain of rock stations playing my music in the hands of like a couple dozen bands, calling it the new rock. And people in their 30s now would remember 10 years ago what happened to my music. This is what they need to hide from you, me. They need to hide me from you. But I have nothing, nothing to hide from you. Um, I heard, I thought I heard somebody say, we want rock last night. And, you know, if they did, like, there's 200 songs in this YouTube account. There's 10 hours of rock in this YouTube account for you to peruse at your convenience. Otherwise, if you, and you already thanked other people for this music, probably, um, and if you want more now, uh, I would maybe suggest that you go to them for it, if they're capable of producing it. I doubt it, though. Um, in my case, I'm going to be very careful with my new, my new rock, uh, because uh, it, uh, if it's going to make money next time, I want to to make money for me, and not someone like who's already a rich rock star, or someone who just wants to be a fraud star. Um, we're into. Oh, I just woke up. You'll have to excuse me. Well, no, I didn't just wake up, but it's still kind of morning. We'll go back into the old story blog here where I have it. Along with uh, this, uh, this poem, which is like, it takes half an hour to recite this poem just by itself. This is only one of eight that I wrote that, and shared in 2007. Each of them are half an hour long. So that's eight of them, you know, eight times half an hour, that's four hours of material there. Four hours of rhyming verses, with all with a lot of humorous content thrown in to keep it you know to keep the reader's interest. And I presented them online as serials, like I would I would write a whole chapter, and I really wouldn't know what was going to come next. And but the rhyming scheme would kind of help it along as I was rhyming it would suggest ideas and. And I just kind of made it up a, a day at a time, or a day or two at a time, and shared it as a serial. And, and, and you know, I, as soon as I would have the chapter finished, I'd post it into my blog. And, and uh, that was how I presented it as a kind of serial as I was writing it. And I actually shared it almost at the same time as I was writing it. Like, it, like I didn't know how any of these were going to end when I started them online. I just wanted to, I just followed the rhyming pattern and it just almost kind of guided me along. Uh, we're getting into the second half now of the masterpiece and uh, you may have seen fragments of this on various TV shows, uh, especially NBC comedy shows. Uh, but, in fact, it is a poem that I shared, one of these serials that I shared that year in 2007. 
I'm going to keep my water close by with this. I, I, some, I didn't realize it was so hard to talk, you know, until I started trying to recite my poems. You know, it's, it's a lot harder than singing my songs, it, it seems, uh, at least as far as getting the words out clearly. And keeping it inside the meter. And, but anyway, I'll see what the, I'll do the best I can here. Some of those rhyme, some of those words are hard to, to say. <laughs> they're hard to. I swear to God, they're hard to say, even though they look easy. So I'm going to start the second half of my poem, the masterpiece. Uh, this is part five, where, and, and and this is a poem about an artist, who gets his. Uh, who gets his uh, paintings all stolen from him, uh, all except for one, his masterpiece. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm, of course, a songwriter who had his music stolen, and I just kind of invented this out of that. Both times that I wrote it, uh, in 2016 and in 2007, as it was happening. This, by the way, this eight verse, this eight chapter, it, with each chapter being eight verses kind of structure. I used it for seven other poems, which I collected all together into a series called, or a collection called the Octaverse. And uh, of course, octa eight verse, because it's verses. And anyway, so here we go with chapter five. This is where he gets his hit painting stolen. Oh no, this is where he paints his hit painting, sorry. Chapter 5, The Masterpiece For any artist worth their salt, obliterating vision's fault was foremost the objective with their basic needs applied. Sorry, let see it. Look, sorry, I can't see it. Let me, let me just uh, zoom in the text, put it in the old man font here. There we are. This is terrible. I'm, uh, I can't believe that my vision is. Anyways, here we go. For any artist worth their salt, obliterating vision's fault was foremost the objective with their basic needs denied. A finalizing master stroke that boundaries of beauty broke to blissful revelations flung the portal open wide. Though David barely made a scent, his time had not been poorly spent developing his palate to a formidable crest. Consumerists might think him flawed, but deemed successful by his god, he'd struggled long to make of his abilities the best. His painting of the modern age, presented as a flimsy stage, whose listless players edged towards the entrance of a shaft, which led straight down to iron jaws expanding to make good their cause, had heretofore been viewed by him as bordering on death. Sorry for that background noise. This is shared accommodation here. But with a touch to emphasize the evil in the usher's eyes, the elements united in a composition grand. With power to undo the grip of television's blinding trip and trigger major consequences utterly unplanned. He'd set up in a public place to reach this echelon of grace, his first spectator dazed by the illuminating sight. The driver readily discerned the treatment his exploiter earned and felt his indignation surge to a ferocious height. His spirit soared with violence against the haughty insolence of tyranny that wasted his duration lived entire, and in a frenzy of delight, as his observers flinched with fright, he torched his boss's vehicle and danced around the fire. The officers sent to address the lady's summons of distress approached the witness for his summary of the affair, and shown the painting to explain the detonation blew again with two more dancers firing their pistols in the air. With that, the artist shed his smock to put up the essential block 
to stop the scene descending into hopeless disarray, and exited towards his hood as nonchalantly as he could, where his incendiary work would in concealment stay. That's about painting a painting. The way painting, painting's art makes people feel things. Art and music makes people feel things. So it's so evil to steal it. So evil. Something to hide from people, for sure. Something to hide. Part six, the networks. Well, you know, Tell me if you think you could guess where I got this from. Part 6, The Networks. Appearances warp how we think and may play to enlarge or shrink, especially when by a mighty corporation cast. Since Mr. Large was running late on sealing David's tragic fate, the networks were assigned to it and ordered to work fast. The advertisers ran campaigns that ridiculed the painter's brains. The media dismissed him as a paltry little speck. The writers fervently repealed the truth his images revealed, combining on the strides he'd made and holding him in check. Among the talent were a few who envied his enlightened view to such a level that they'd gladly join in the rebuff and use their status to donate more fury to the tide of hate to further the acclaim of which they never had enough. Their push for such an ill effect elicited the disrespect that brought a thief to make off with the life work from his room. The masterpiece was tucked away, but all the rest were on display by greedy hands unfastened, and about to meet their doom. The thief decided he would be the hero of their treachery, supplanting his smug face as the collection's rightful source. His bid for worshipped vanity, though rooted in insanity, by shallow network standards, was the fittest to endorse. He took the paintings on a tour and let their virtue plain and pure. A global crowd of fans to his delusions way deceive. Adopting the same name as Christ, his signature grew highly priced until in his divinity he started to believe. Surrounded by his pretty wives, he opened up the new archives donating it a portion from his store of precious loot. As far as he could theorize, the way to heaven was with lies. His name on canvases he stole, and fame beyond dispute. With that which had their rule defied now operating on their side, the work. The networks made a fortune as their apprehensions eased, the public firmly in their spell, to throw the victim in a cell, would ratify their fraudulence and make their master pleased. If you're going to make a star out of a fraud, then you have to throw the fraud in jail, don't you? Right? Just like when the networks, you know, when they don't tell you that these stars stole my work and went to jail, then they want you to think I'm lying about it. Of course. How nice. I'm supposed to like them, right? Sorry, sorry. I'm supposed to be sweet to them. I'm supposed to be sweet like they are. Right? I wish. I wish I could be like that. I wish I could remove myself from their, you know, their abuse long enough to be able to just relax and be like that. Part 7, 
the crisis. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this chapter of the masterpiece was aired on an NBC program. I can't remember if it was daytime or nighttime. I can't remember if it was Ellen or Jay Leno, but it did air. I heard the last verse of it. I caught the last verse of it when I was turning on my TV, the very last verse, which told me that they just broadcast the whole thing. It's called The Crisis, and this is where everything, this is kind of the climax of the story. Now what's happening is a fraud has made off with his master, with his paintings, but not with his masterpiece, which was tucked away to keep it safe, but to keep people from, stop people from going nuts from looking at it. And uh, he's stolen all the other paintings, though, and made his career, made his name, and he's a big famous artist, a big rebel artist, uh, from stealing all this work. And left David, of course, to suffer, you know, the, uh, the effect of the crowd all thinking that he's, you know, nothing special, any, you know, whatever, thinking maybe that he's dishonest, whatever. But here we see how, at the end of this poem, we see how it, you just end up, when you're going to make a hero out of a fraud, then you have to make, a, you know, a monster out of the victim to back it up. So he's a good guy for abusing me, you know, because I'm such a monster, right? That's how it works. I can't say it's made my life very easy to live for the last 12 years. Part 7, the crisis. So they're going to try to throw him in jail now. The crisis. From David's end, the interlude, since cut down by the crime so crude, consisted of a growing chorus howling for his hide. From those that used to kudos pay, and tell him he'd be big one day, as though they'd never watched him working, standing at his side. They swaggered by him in a group as he stood waiting for his soup, to mock his sad condition and add insult to his shame. The women who'd once stood agog now talked down to him like a dog, and even children had a go at his peculiar name. The sorry soul was mystified as to the blitz against his pride, his mean detractor's party stipulating to exclude. The thought of years of work he'd lost inclined his body to exhaust, as well as being rather detrimental to his mood. And then a well-armed escort barged to take him downtown to be charged, with cameras behind them linked directly to the news. For paintings he'd been said to claim that as their Jesus were the same, when of his own accomplishments he had but one to choose, the frilly fool in hat and tail who'd come to watch the trip to jail, was he who'd thwarted God's fine plan to glorify the plain. Directing to the walls he'd stripped, as dubiously unequipped, he asked the poor bewildered artist if he could explain. Extracting from a yawning groove as lenses zoomed to folly prove. The suspect held his masterpiece up for their eyes to know. And carried by the network's beams, their own collapsing at the seams, the total globe to feral pandemonium would throw. The fraud was grabbed and turned on ear. The field technicians smashed their gear. The firemen were called and on the collar turned their hose. The elephants inside the zoo 
were loose to see what they could do as outside network headquarters an angry mob arose. The military sent their tanks to use against the stores and banks, their cannons blasting holes through which the plunderers could pour. As Mr. Large's ending loomed, by penthouse walls a man entombed, the crisis reached a pinnacle that he could not ignore. Now we're definitely going to get to the ending here, and I can't tell you if they use this when they... But it's very religious, it's, and if they used it, I find it impossible to see how they could not go to hell for it and be punished directly. <sighs> it's called The Judgment. It's this is where I have to resolve everything. I'm on my eighth verse, and I have to try to wrap it all up in eight verses, in eight more verses in this meter. And by this time, I'm almost burning out from all the rhyming and everything. But what I do is I just add up all these questions, and what's going to happen to this guy? What's going to happen to that? How are we going to resolve this? And I try to be fair about it. I try to be fair, as fair as I can. The fairer I am, it seems, the more people I please with the ending. So, let's see what happens to all these characters now. Part 8, The Judgment The troubled boss's opulence from Lucifer was no defense, the potency surrounding and compelling him to kneel. The time had come to tall exact, the vision of whose grave impact immersed him in a dread that brought his consciousness to real. His wealth exchanged to buy the fork, to prod him like a piece of pork, stripped naked through combustible lanes of ignominy. Would Mr. Large, a person broke, become his foe's convenient joke from agonizing present to the worst eternity? But he who had the devil wooed, when faced with death, was deftly shrewd. Agreeing to the terms by which he'd suffer to repent, his error would be rectified to make his victim satisfied and to repair the damages his money would be spent. Successful with the patchy ploy, the rescued chairman wept with joy which rested on cooperation from the one he harmed. Though Lucifer would not object, his irritation made erect by deity's false claim that had the population charmed. Deity's false claim. The deities don't like that. The guilty one would compensate by ages he would have to wait, a writhing mass of misery impaled upon a hook. Suspended in the central square where anyone could stop and stare, before a single person would have any cause to look. His arrogance had flown too high to with the prince of darkness vie. Don't forget, Jesus defeated Satan. Anyone who's going to say he's Jesus is going to piss Satan off. Unlike his cunning boss, who yielded to a higher force, that guy, you know, these, these business guys, they negotiate their way out of everything. Nor could the Holy Trinity abide his false divinity. A dead end to abandonment had been his chosen course. With David's rise to prominence, the truth would come to dominance, uncompromising in his drive for more reality. By injuries he had sustained, he took his prize as fairly gained, proceeding to the pedestal of immortality. This is where I have to get philosophic to try to wrap it all up. <laughs> Ha ha ha. 
Though puzzling might be the sense that guides the hand of providence, a climate for fair-mindedness was duly to be seen. With actions taking precedence above one's own resemblance, to spare the world from loss and keep the competition clean.